Moments with Mary Ann. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guest, Jason Gregory. And he's here today to share with us his new book, Emotional Intuition for Peak Performance, Secrets from the Sages for Being in the Zone. Now, have you ever wondered if there was a connection between emotional intuition and peak performance? Jason's here today to share with us the four fundamental daily habits and routines that can empower your life. Now, Jason is a teacher and international speaker specializing in the fields of Eastern and Western philosophy, comparative religion, metaphysics, and ancient cultures. For many years, he has lived in Asia studying the spiritual traditions and meditative practices of Buddhism, Hinduism, and Taoism, visiting some of the most remote places in the world. So joining us from Australia today, let's welcome Jason Gregory. Thank you for having me on, Marianne. It's a pleasure. You know, what an honor it is to have you here. And my goodness, I mean, we get to have this discussion. You're all the way in Australia. And I'm so excited to talk about this new book of yours. Well, thank you. Yeah, the the marvels of modern technology, yeah? We can be sitting over. Yeah, the Pacific Ocean is between you and I. So it's really really great. And I don't take that sort of, you know, ability that we have now these days for granted. Yeah, what a great age we live in, right? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, well, a lot of people... (laughs) Well, a lot of people would say we don't live in a great age, but I, I, I think we do anyway. Well, you know, I'd have to agree with you. I mean, yeah, we're in this age of turmoil and transition, but there's a lot of good that can come from that. And, do you know, and before we get too far ahead, I really would like for you to share with us, like, what was your, like, inspiration? Because I know you've written all these other books. I mean, you're really well known for just really kind of being on this really – you know, consciousness path. What inspired you to write this book? This one specifically was uh, a combination of probably. It's kind of a blend of my my previous two books before this one, which were which were fasting the mind and effortless living. So you know, I was getting a lot of feedback, even though I had sort of slowly started writing this book, you know, while those two were being published. But a lot of the feedback was like, you know, how can we sort of live a more of a like a holistic sort of life you know instead of just focusing just on meditation um just on you know exercise or 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 any of these things and especially with my work in Taoism, like where i focus a lot on wu wei which is we could translate that as uh, non-doing or effortless action or how i translate in the book as intelligent spontaneity so people were you know curious about how they could apply, especially that aspect to their lives, but also for myself personally, because I always knew that, especially within Taoism, there was this uh, element, this kind of skill component, which I felt applied uh, into into fields like such as like you know athletics or music or just art in general, and so that was kind of the inspiration behind that because I knew that that actually applies to that. And you often hear about, you know, you often hear a lot of, uh, you know, people involved in uh, sport or, or that, or, or even art where they talk about how they get in the flow or they get in the zone. And so I really wanted to dive into that aspect because I knew about that from a Taoist perspective and also from a cognitive science perspective. So I really wanted that. That was kind of the motivation for the book because I want, I knew that there was a model that people could apply to their life to, you know, to excel in their own lives. So I know it's kind of an, and they're odd bedfellows to have, you know, Eastern spirituality mixed with uh, modern science, but there are a lot of overlays there that, you know, they relate and uh, they sink into it together well. And it's about time they did, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. It is about time they did. And I think that a lot of people, you know, uh, because we do live in an age of like where we, we, we categorize everything, right? So that's got to be over there, isolated from this. And, you know, back in the old ancient times, that, that was never the case, Marianne. You know, a lot of science and spirituality were mixed together, but we're constantly in this age of compartmentalizing everything. Like, you know, that's got to be in that category. That's got to be over there. And that's actually, 
that's not very helpful when you explore, especially a lot of these uh, deeper philosophical and uh, spiritual concepts. Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, here we are talking about this age again, but, you know, we're at this point in history where all this is dovetailing together and kind of, and getting to the point where it is uh, making more sense for people who are left and right brain. So it's nice to be able to have this, you know, in a way where people are going, okay, you know, maybe I'm all left brain, but I can really understand how this applies, you know, in regards to just me, because you talk about it, your book is titled Emotional Intuition, like how this could apply to my life. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and a lot, yeah, like you said, a lot of people will cling to either their left or right brain, or, you know, these days they're either liberal or conservative. You know, there's, there's a constant uh, separation of, you know, who we, who we are. And, and I would say that, you know, like I speak about in the book, as you mentioned, emotional intuition. So to understand that, we have to talk sort of about the embodied mind. So instead of being all, like you said, all left brain, all intuitive, all, um, you know, in, in some sense, if you're, if you're too left brain, then it, you can get a bit floaty and, you know, airy fairy with, without being grounded. But then if you're too, um, if you're too intellectual, then you can get, you know, very, you know, um, you look at the world around us, you know what I mean? It can become very stiff, stern, and, you know, not, empathize with others and so did but you know i go further in depth in in the book as you know like when i explore the ideas of uh hot and cold cognition which relate to which are actually important to understand emotional intuition you know slash intelligent spontaneity so you know the the cold cognition is that rational aspect of our mind where which we've which we've primarily focused on actually in the world, which is to do with education, to do with the intellect. It's kind of the the cognitive control centers in our mind. It's what it's what makes you Marianne, what makes me Jason, or what makes us think that that's all we are. You know, so this this prefrontal cortex in the in the front of our mind. Um, but it's the hot cognition is is basically the the more unconscious regions in the brain. So basically the the larger aspect of our, the, the, the majority of our brain actually, which is actually really the driving force of uh, most of our life really. It's what makes us open and close our hands. It, it's what makes you and I pick up social cues with each other and facial expressions and be able to intuit, you know, how to communicate with each other, you know, all of these subtle things that we don't think about, which actually translate to also a lot of, uh, uh, skill as well like but at the same time if, if you if you're only uh, in the hot cognition you know you can fall into things like intuitive errors and, and stuff like that where we, we where we will perceive something in, in in the environment for example but it's not exactly how we intuit you know this is like an intuitive error and i explain a few of those in the book um so the the basic the basis of like emotional intuition is, is basically a merging of that that cold and hot cognition which is called the embodied mind and this is kind of what is trained actually in eastern philosophy and in such spiritual paths such as zen buddhism where they're training the individual to act immediately but but also be appropriate to each situation so that's definitely something that we could use in the modern world because usually we're acting immediately without thinking about it or, or in, in, or in another sense, we're trying to be over appropriate, and we think too much, and we're not acting, you know, immediately to the situation. And so, you know, that's kind of a heightened sense of practice in Eastern spirituality, where you're trying to get to that stage of, you know, acting immediate, but also being appropriate to each and every situation that you encounter. So, using that technique, how is that helpful for people who are looking? to, you know, really kind of manage their performance in a greater way? I mean, can this be used for anybody or is it just for athletes? Not for anyone, Mary, it's for anyone. It's actually, this is more, you know, I, as you know, in the book, I focus a, a large portion of the book on, you know, trying to enhance people's skill and, and, and reach peak performance. But at the same time, these are 
life skills that you know that we actually uh, that's actually the more important component of it so the Zhuangs are like one of the inspirations behind this book Zhuangs are one of the great Taoist sages uh, second to Lao Tzu in his text you know there are a lot of skill stories and this and that like yeah, there's a story of Butcher Ding right so Butcher Ding is this you know it's a pretty graphic uh, description but it's, it's like this butcher who cuts up an ox so effortlessly and so Lord Wen Wei, he's the lord of the time, the king, and he goes to this ceremony. He sees Butcher Ding cut it up so effortlessly, and then he's you know he's amazed by his skill, and then he asks him like, why, you know, how how have you perfected this? You know, how, how do you do this? Like, and and Butcher Ding kind of said, you know, when I first encountered the ox, you know, all I could see was the ox, but then after three years, I I go at the ox. Uh, all I see is I, I see with spirit. So he sees the 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 like the pattern of the the ox, and he moves through the bones effortlessly and through the ligaments and whatnot effortlessly. And this is kind of like a, a metaphor for how we move uh, efficaciously through life, instead of like moving through life and incurring harm on others and also on ourselves. We have this skill and this ability to move through life without, you know, sort of like disturbing life or causing, just interfering life in general. Because most of the, especially from the Dallas perspective, if, if we look at all the problems in the world, it's based on over-identification. And then once we over-identify with this idea of who we think we are, then we all have a personal agenda, which we superimpose on a world that, you know, in and of itself is completely innocent, you know, but we're superimposing our perspective on it. So the skill, you know, I talk about fasting the mind in the book is to fast the mind and to see the world purely for what it is, which allows you to move through the world efficaciously without incurring harm on yourself, but also, you know, um, causing harm to others. So, so, so yeah, to get back to your point, point in a long winded way, it, it, it is more about life skills. It's about how we deal with everyday life in general. So how do we deal with every situation with immediacy, but also being appropriate to each and every situation? Well, I'm glad you took the long way there because that makes a whole lot of sense. (laughs) (laughs) And it's important that, you know, we dive into this because I really felt like your book had a lot of profound information and I'd love for you to share with us because we've talked about cognition. Why don't you share with us like some of the benefits and flaws of both cognitions? Excellent, good point. Um, well, yes, the, the one of the, the the well, let's start with hot cognition, right? So the flaws with hot cognition is basically the the intuitive errors aspect. So, so if we look at hot cognition, because it is it is a spontaneous cognition so we will look at like things like you know like say for example i don't know if you like chocolate cake marianne but if there's a you know if there's a big piece of chocolate cake (laughs) sitting there and and you've dedicated you said okay in 2020 i'm watching my diet i'm i'm not gonna you know indulge in sugars and and so forth and so on um but then next minute there's a big chocolate cake there you know what does the the hot hot cognition instantly do it's like well sugar good let's let's eat you know so you know and and that that that's that's obviously an, an evolutionary response because we we needed sugars in the past you know to um you know to survive when we didn't live in a society that we live in now but the problem is is those evolutionary urges are still there but we live in a society where you and i have the luxury of going to you know a um a supermarket right so we have the luxury of going to a supermarket and, um, you know, we can fill out our trolley full of sugar as much as we want. So that's one of the flaws of the hot cognition. But also, so also intuitive errors, which I speak about a lot. So intuitive errors basically meaning the, the ability to see something in the environment and intuit that, oh, I think that that's the, you know, you spontaneously have have a view of what that is instantly. So, you know, I use a few examples in the book. I used the uh, the Mueller liar illusion, which, which you may have remembered, where there's two lines, um, which 
there's actually two lines with that is two arrows on each end, but they they are either inverted or they're pointed pointed out. And but the the line looks when you look at it on first impression, it looks like the straight line, the horizontal line, is the same size, both lines. But then, in in I mean, they in actuality, they're the same size. I did I say they they look like they're different sizes, I should say, but in actuality, they're the same size. So that's one evidence of that and, and the other evidence of that i use a actually a puzzle in the book which is which is a pretty common puzzle where i talk about uh, the bat and ball i don't know if you remember that one where where i, I ask you know a bat and ball cost a dollar ten um, mm-hmm. and the bat costs one dollar more than the ball how much does the ball cost and so you know a lot of people's uh instant reaction is to uh say 10 cents but it's actually five cents you know and i don't want to get too far into that but you know people can look up that sort of puzzle online um but and it's interesting because a lot of even when they tested people with this puzzle in harvard and places like that it was something outrageous like 80 percent or something got it wrong because most of the time we trust our hot cognition you know so i trust my hot cognition to be able to sense you know, a lot of things in the environment, social cues, uh, what the tone of your voice and everything, you know. So we, we trust ourselves in that sense. So, But there can be flaws. Look, most of the time those those uh, intuitions are right, but there are uh, flaws in that. So that's the flaws of the hot cognition. And so as for the flaws of the cold, now it's basically to do with the over-identification with the I, so the over-identification with uh, Jason. So because the the cold cognition in the prefrontal cortex is kind of the that cognitive control center of that, that intellect, which, you know, sort of dissects life according to our own, you know, beliefs, then that builds this illusion of, you know, Jason as an Australian, as blah, 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 you know, and we have these beliefs about ourselves, which inform our reality or our, our experience of reality. And then this can obviously lead to problems, right? So, so we, uh, the cold cognition has this ability to um, make us over identify with ourselves and at the same time make us think too much, which stops the hot cognition from just doing its thing, from being spontaneous. And effortless like so a perfect example of this is a musician where when a musician is highly trained if they just allow their the wisdom of the body the hot cognition to take over then the you know the music comes out beautifully but then when they start to overthink about what they're doing you'll often hear them you know they'll they'll stuff up so but in in saying that that also alludes to the benefits of cold cognition whereas if you want to um, train be uh, you know if you want to learn something thoroughly you need to have a strong cold cognition because you need to learn for example for if, if we're talking about music you need to learn how to play that instrument so you need kind of a discipline to learn it over time but then once the the hot cognition it's downloaded in the hot cognition then you kind of you don't need the cold uh cold cognition anymore because the hot cognition has this kind of second nature so to speak um you know, which which allows the music to to play beautifully. So, it's it's kind of a this this is you know why I say it, you have to come back into this kind of embodied state of consciousness where um, you're not either or, but both benefit each other because we have to remember both are actual functions of the mind. It's not like you can say you can get rid of your cold cognition. You can't. You can down regulate it in certain times through. Um, meditation and exercise and so forth and so on and you can uh, diminish its its effect over you but you, it's not like it's going to disappear you know so and also when i go back to the, the you know, sorry <laughs> to keep going but mary ever to get back to the chocolate cake analogy the cold cognition is actually what will help you you know um stop it, it will help you not eat the, the chocolate cake you know as opposed to your hot cognition going you know sugar good let's eat this you'll say oh wait up wait up I'm, I'm on a diet here i need to you know rein this in so you know that, that that's kind of in a uh, 
briefly the, the benefits and, and also the flaws of, of, of hot, co- hot and cold cognition. Well, I'm really glad you took the time to share that with us because I think it really breaks it down and makes a little bit more sense about how this all comes together. And you can see how when, you know, we have people who are using their emotional intuition, they gain that, that area where they're like in the zone that you talked about earlier. Yeah, definitely. Well, th- and, and it also alludes to a, another thing that I didn't speak about a lot about this in the book, but what Zhuangzi would say is that once you're sort of, you have that smooth cognition of where you have this embodied mind. This leads to a stage of, uh, in Chinese, it's xiao yao yu, which means free and easy wandering. So that's this state where you are completely free in the world and your mind is not stuck to anything. So you have a mind of no deliberation. So you, you, you are, it's not just free and easy wandering in the physical sense it can be in the physical sense but it's more such it's more so a, a state of consciousness you know so um this ability where you can you're, you're shapeless you can move here and there without you know incurring harm but also causing trouble and so that's that's this free and easy wandering state of consciousness which according to especially Taoism, is like the ultimate state of mind where because your mind is fully embodied and your body is mindful and then you are, in a sense, perfectly calibrated to the environment instead of being uh, opposed by the environment. So, because we are nature, right? Now, a lot of people forget we are nature because we do overtrain our cold cognition to make us feel disconnected with the world. But uh, we are part of nature. And that's what, you know, a lot of the things that I talk about in the book is a, is pointing the people in the direction of this this free and easy wandering state of consciousness, which is, is actually our true nature before we, you know, went through the, the whole rigors of education and, and socialization. So what are some ways we can cultivate, you know, just intelligent spontaneity? Cultivate intelligent spontaneity. Um, well, I, I use a lot of things. I use in the book. I talk about the four fundamentals. So to culti- to cultivate this this sense of being immediate and appropriate. So ways to cultivate it, and when, and the four fundamentals I speak about are uh, meditation, sleep, nutrition, and exercise. And I know that may sound simplistic, but in the book I get into a lot of the science behind that, a lot of the practices that. Um, that especially with meditation, that will benefit people's, you know, output or productivity or ability to be in this state. So those that sort of training, for example, like fasting the mind, I talk about a lot of, you know, I have a whole book dedicated to that. So there's a there's a passage where uh, Zhuangzi, in, in the Zhuangzi text, where Zhuangzi plays kind of like the mouthpiece of Confucius. And Confucius has um, this disciple called Yan Wei, and Yan Wei is kind of like he has all of these uh, plans to, you know, change this ruler in the West and so forth and so on. And then Confucius throws them all out and says, "You need to fast the mind. And once you fast the mind, then you you get back into this this state of intelligent spontaneity where you are being uh, spontaneous, but also appropriate to each and every situation." And you know, Young Wei says, "I you know I fast all the time," and, you know, but he's, he's thinking about the fasting of the body. So the fasting of the mind is basically, in a sense, the elimination of a lot of distractions in your life, and the elimination of um, you know just external noise in general, which will help your own internal chatter, which then allows you to be more present in in each and every situation. And so that's that's more related to kind of the. The, the meditation aspect of trying to cultivate this intelligent spontaneity. But then we also have the, the nutrition aspect, you know, and I speak, I have a lot of tips in the nutrition aspect all the way from like mindful eating to also um, disciplined eating, like meaning that, you know, I don't, I don't, in the book, I don't want to get into things like, you know, what you should eat and shouldn't eat, even though I have a, a few tips there, but, you know, I think there's too much of a, too much noise around people 
saying that they're carnivores or vegans or you know blah 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 or all of these things uh, it especially from the eastern perspective it's more about being disciplined in, in your diet so whatever diet you follow you follow that to the nth degree so to speak um and then also on top of that i have the the exercise component so exercise is a is a a good practice actually when you do a lot of cardio to get your mind back more comfortable with this this zone like feeling and we've all felt that when we kind of let the body do its thing and then once the you know you you, you exert a lot of energy the cold cognition begins to uh, down regulate and then you start to feel what that kind of sense of consciousness is and then the last new uh fundamental i talk about is sleep which a lot of people actually neglect these days but it's kind of the bedrock for the other three so you know if you're not well rested then it's your mind and your ability to function in the world is going to be you know hampered so i talk a little bit about the science of sleep in the book and and just about how that, that nourishes the other fundamentals and allows that that state of intelligence spontaneity to to come to to be alive you know so and you know in the east the in zen buddhism the way that they would train intelligence spontaneity was through like zen koans like they would talk about you know they would give a koan is kind of like a riddle or a puzzle that the master would give the student and then the whole idea was to get them out of that intellectual habit we have when if i give you something you you're trying to like overthink about it without you know sitting with it and and just allowing you know in some sense the subconscious to do what it's designed to do you know to read the environment to work it out inside in time and then to be able to to, to deliver an immediate and appropriate response and so i talk a lot about that so there's a lot of things in the book marian about cultivating intelligence spontaneity Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Jason Gregory in regards to his new book, Emotional Intuition for Peak Performance. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here's where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient Secrets of Manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with our special guest, Jason Gregory, and he's sharing with us his new book, Emotional Intuition for Peak Performance. 
Secrets from the Sages for Being in the Zone. Now, before we went for a break, we covered so much, Jason, and I just have to ask you, you are so dialed in when it comes to both Eastern and Western philosophies. You know, where did all this knowledge come from? Did you spend years of education? Were you just born with this? You arrived on the planet with all this information. Where did you get all this information? <laughs> You're starting to sound like my wife. <laughs> <laughs> she thinks I'm born with it. I, I don't think so. I, I think, um, I don't know. I don't know if you've ever had this feeling before that when you were introduced to something, it it felt like, almost like you, 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 you knew it a little bit or, or it felt so comfortable. Uh, the knowledge felt like easy to act, you know, easy to understand. I don't, I'm not saying that all Eastern spirituality is easy, easy to understand, but like, first of all, 13 years ago when I first, I, I moved to India, when I first went to India, it was like when I was learning uh, Vedanta and yoga, like, the, I don't know, the knowledge felt very familiar to me. And, and you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not alluding to like any sort of past life thing, but it just, the, the, it's, it was almost like a missing piece of the puzzle that I, I, I had studied philosophy a little bit before that point in time, but um, it just felt, you know, the idea of, you know, dissecting who, who are we, um, what's the nature of the I, the nature of the universe, these sorts of questions were, I, I always had, but I, I sort of, I didn't have, you know, a good framework or a, a good understanding, you know, I, I I always use the example like when I was very young, like so, like thirteen, um, and I'd be asking my brother, like, you know, what's you know, what's the nature, of, what's what's this reality, you know? My brother's like, you know, why don't you go and smoke another joint or something? But I, I didn't smoke, you know. <laughs> so, so I'd be asking him these things when I was really young because it it really fascinated me, like just the the nature of this world always fascinated me. So when I found Eastern spirituality. It, gave me a lot of answers that I, I suppose I had always unconsciously been looking for. Yeah, and, and then over time, I've just, because I, I moved to India and I travel, I've, you know, I've lived in Asia for a, a large portion of my adult life. I've just, you know, have thrust myself into that world and, and have studied, you know, a lot of Eastern spirituality and just, I guess, over the years, my understanding has just become more vast and i don't know if that's a, a pro- byproduct of me you know having some sort of deeper sense or me just you know more of an accumulative thing over time from being in the east you know it's probably a, a mix of both i guess well it's interesting i mean if we get into <clears throat> excuse me reincarnation i'm sure we've all swept the temple floor at one time or another you know <laughs> so yeah, for sure. <laughs> definitely. I think so. I think so. You know, so. But I, I'd say, like, especially with Eastern spirituality, one of the the best things for me was was traveling and being in the cultures, and you know, not just going also on, you know, because I have a lot of friends who are who who you teach Eastern philosophy in universities and so forth and so on, and they'll just go for like research trips to India or Nepal or you know Sri Lanka or Thailand, these places where. where you know, I, I, there is benefit in that, but I always felt it's better to go and immerse yourself in those cultures and stay there for, you know, years if, 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 if it's something that you feel compelled to do. And so that's what what I have done in the past. And, you know, especially going to places like India and Nepal really have, you know, definitely transformed my life because it, it gave me, especially as a Westerner, a different view of you know how people live culture and also the, the cognitive differences that uh, a lot of westerners and easterners have which i don't think is is widely studied or even appreciated in the world today well i think books like yours because you've got so many books that kind of bridge the eastern and western philosophies i, I believe books like yours help people to kind of understand the true importance that that brings to our societies. Definitely, definitely, Marion. And I think that that's uh, what's needed in the world right now, right? Like there are cognitive differences that uh, it's not, not appreciated. Uh, 
um, one book I, I'd highly recommend your listeners to read is a book called uh, Geography of Thought by, by Richard Nisbet. And that gets into a lot of the, the, the differences between the way Easterners and Westerners think. And, and it's only really a study on Easterners and Westerners. It's not a study on you know a lot of other parts of the world, but uh, the differences between those two different cognitions. And, and what's really interesting about that study, which actually you know, gives you evidence as to why certain philosophies developed in the West and as opposed to the East is that the Eastern model of mind is is more holistic as opposed to the um, Western one, which is more individualistic. And that's actually an evolutionary thing going back to how, uh, you know, going back to agriculture and also back to just the way that we evolved in the West and the East. So, like, for, to give you an example, like the... The East, the, there was much more of a collective feeling in the East because it was linked to, like, if we look in India and China, the you know the resource for for food was rice. So, to to you know to harvest rice and to produce rice, you you have to have large you know, population of people collectively working together. But then, if we look at the evolution of Greece, which is kind of the the heart of the West, there was this this focus on um, individual tasks, so you know, fishing, herding, hunting, these things that we could do individually. So, and it's not to say that one is better than the other; they're different uh, cognitive styles that we we both Easterners and Westerners both intrinsically have, but one is more ramped up more than the other, and so. That's why in the in like for example in America you're in America there is a, a heightened sense of individualism, as opposed to if we say uh, places like India or China where there's more of a heightened sense of collectivism and kind of a, a sense of that the people uh, are not opposed to, they have a feeling that they belong uh, to one another right so India especially being mainly Hindu there's most people have general cognitive uh, cultural traits uh, a general sense of community and so forth and so on which a lot of you know americans and you know i know australians not like myself we go there and we're blown away by the sense of community you know because usually in our countries there's a lot of like uh, you know conflict between you know look just look at the, look at america at the moment you know conflict between uh, personal self-interest and, and so forth and so on so um that's really interesting when you look at that study, you know, when you look at the differences between East and West. And I think that both, when you look at from, especially both positions, both can learn from each other. Like, so as Westerners, you and I can learn more about the holistic perspective of life, where Easterners can also learn more about, you know, taking care of themselves individually and so forth and so on. There has to be kind of be this fine balance. And I think that's kind of what slowly happening yeah you can definitely feel there's a shift happening and it's interesting i was really fascinated how you know i know you've brought this up or we've talked about but uh, fasting of the mind having that as part of your um of this book is i know you have your book fasting the mind that's also available but just being able to kind of get to basics you know, I think is a real important thing. And, and you had so many great tips and information resources for people to kind of get into a place where we're starting to get, you know, to what really matters. Because I think a lot of times we have so much going on, we, we can't even pay attention to what really matters. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. But there's, there's so much noise out there, right? So it's, it's, um, well, yeah, fasting the mind is, I think, one of the best practices for for that marianne i think that um you know for people that don't really know what fasting well i've kind of spoke a little bit about it but it is about excluding a lot of that external noise eliminating a lot of that and getting back to as you mentioned the basics getting back to that fundamentals where we are just you know to use uh zen master lin chi's example you know just uh eat sleep uh, they eat crap and go to bed. <laughs> yeah, that's his, that's, his, that's his philosophy in life. You know, don't don't think too much about the world. Don't project your own personal agendas. Just get back to those fundamental basics, which allow you know allow you know life to be as it will without 
coming into conflict with one another. And I think that a lot of, especially in, you know, even our generation and younger generations and even older than our generation is we, we've, we've been brought up on television, on news, on all of these things, which keeps our mind focused on a lot of drama in life. And, and you know, the news are not in the business of promoting positive things, even though a lot of the more things in the world are positive than negative, you know, but it's just not newsworthy. You know, we have this negativity bias in our mind from evolution that we, you know, for whatever reason, a lot of people are more attracted to uh, negativity and drama than they're uh, attracted to expressions of love and positivity, you know, which is, you know, in psychology, they actually call that an insane tendency, but we still have that within us. So when, when we talk about, you know, in relating all of that to fasting the mind, we have to look at things like we have to start to detox from distraction, right? So we've got to get, we've got to stop distracting our mind and allow it come, allow our mind to come back down into that state of equilibrium. And so when we look at the science of fasting the mind, we're talking about two branches of the nervous system in the, in the autonom autonomic nervous system, which are the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is what's activated when we're, we're you know, consuming uh, any sort of noise, like on, on our smartphones, we might be on, our, on the Facebook feed or something like this, but also just from being active in general. So it's stimulated through activity. And not just physical activity, as I mentioned with the smartphone, if you think you're going to relax at home and sit down and watch, you know, binge on a, a Netflix series, you're, you're, you're still activating a lot of the sympathetic nervous system. The other one is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is stimulated through, uh, it's kind of called the rest and digest or, or feed and breed um, aspect of the nervous system where that's kind of contributes, I mean, that's activated through doing nothing. I know, and I know that doesn't sound exciting for your listeners, but it's it's activated through doing nothing. So it's activated through, obviously through sleep, it's activated through meditation. But the problem, and a lot of the problems with society in general is on an individual level, we're not accessing the parasympathetic nervous system throughout the day. And I don't just mean in a 20-minute 20, 20 meditation. You know, you've you got to do maybe a little bit more than that, but that little bit of meditation in the morning is actually enough to not can be enough to nourish your intellectual life you know throughout the day so uh, it's, it's important for us to access that parasympathetic nervous system and so we've got to get away from distractions we've got to stop you know every moment we have we've got to stop looking at our phone you know we've got to start to as i mentioned in the book you we've got to embrace boredom you know instead of running away from boredom let's Let's dive into it and explore it a little bit, you know, because often boredom is the result of our minds, our mind being accustomed to filling itself up. So once you pull the plug on that, it's kind of like, uh, you know, like the overhead fans. When you turn the overhead fan off, it's still going for a little bit. That's kind of like our mind is when you pull the plug on the noise, that boredom is 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 like that the, the fan with the the juice still in it but you just got to sit with it for a while and once you begin to access the parasympathetic nervous system a lot you start to become more comfortable with actually uh, doing nothing you know and i'm not saying that you should sit around and do nothing all day but if we reevaluate our life and we see that the amount of you know the amount of noise we consume then it is important to you know the brakes on that and you know in, in regards to fasting the mind there are other things i mentioned in the book like um that will actually help you to have that basic mind that you sp speak about where i talk about like not engaging in gossip so try not to engage in gossip anymore and, and gossip actually has become you know pretty much part and parcel with the world these days because of the media and you know, so not engaging in things like that, which which actually stimulate, overstimulate the mind, and keep it agitated and keep it focused, also externally instead of you know putting your awareness back in, in, in inside yourself. And I also speak about also don't try not to be cynical. Um, 
you know, which <laughs> cynicism is a, is a big part of the world, but it's, um, and, and, it's, and it's really hard to overcome. Obviously, you know, we've all suffered from being over, overly cynical. And, you know, some people may argue there are times when we may need to be cynical, but not all the time, you know. So, and also one, one other thing that I mentioned uh, in regards to fasting the mind is also, well, actually, there's a few other things. There's eliminating multitasking. So this ability, you know, we have the ability to multitask, right? We can multitask, but it often causes a lot of internal noise. Um, and, and, and actually, especially cognitive scientists, they will say that the mind is actually not designed for multitasking. It's, it's analog. It's not digital. You know, so it's, it's designed to do one thing at a time very efficiently, but it can do multi, it can multitask, but it doesn't, you know, achieve the results that it would one at a time. So, you know, I go into many other things like wake up rituals in regards to fasting the mind. And also uh, probably my favorite part is dropping off the map and blissing out. <laughs> so, you know, I like that one. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> That's my personal favorite. <laughs> yeah. I, I like that one a lot. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it, it's, it's really important, isn't it, Marianne, just to give ourselves that time, right? Like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Cause otherwise, you know, we get to this point where we're so busy doing, we just don't get to be a, like a human being, you know? <laughs> yeah. We feel like a robot, right? Like it feels like you're just, I don't know, like, you know, when I'm in society and I have a lot of things to do, it feels like you, you're, you're kind of, you're just jumping obstacles all day, you know, like you're jumping obstacles, you're trying to put out fires. Yeah. And then like what you said beautifully, you forget to be a human, right? You just, you, you don't, you have no time to be a human and a lot of people experience this unfortunately a lot of people who have families experience this because you know they have a day job and then they come home they've got to tend to the kids and, and you do need to do all these things but we need to look at the nature of society right like the nature of society may not be as healthy as what it alludes to be so dropping off the map and blissing out is a uh, one of the most important things because then you can just get away from everything away from internet away from tv away from the so-called social problems that we have and we can just then focus on our immediate life like focus then on our mind our body you know remember to you know enjoy breathing you know which we often don't we forget to to breathe and you know all of these all of these wonderful things that we can access when we you know, drop out of society. And actually why I say bliss out in that, in the book is because in the East, there is a common understanding that when you do renounce the world, so to speak, you renounce the world and you go to the forest, like a Vanaprastha in, in, in Hinduism, is you access this deeper element of our mind, which is completely, they say bliss or blissed out, almost like you're stoned, you know what I mean? Say, so, but you're stoned on life, where because you've you're not consumed with the noise anymore. Actually, the noise in your mind is completely turned down, and you've accessed this pure nature you have about yourself, which is actually pure joy, and and un, actually unassociated and undifferentiated. You know, so that that's kind of our true nature. Each and every one of us is this unassociated, undifferentiated aspect of ourselves. But it's hard to access that. By just you know meditating a few times a day, or if you're engaged in a daily job, sometimes you need to really just drop off the map to experience that, and then and and, and then maybe you can bring that understanding back to to society. As Joseph Campbell said, you bring back the boon, you know, of that understanding to to society. Well, and from what I understand, you've actually done that, right? Where you've gone and done those meditations you know, in the forest and, and spent time really getting to the point where you're, you know, kind of living what you're teaching people. Yeah, well, yeah, I have. I, I gave myself the time. A lot of people ask me, like, how'd you do it? And it's like, well, I, I just gave myself the time, you know, like I gave myself the time to do that. So, if, for example, like a uh, couple of places that I, I really love, like uh, Tiruvannamalai in India and also Bodh Gaya, and so Tiruvannamalai is famous for uh, the holy mountain Arunachala and also the sage Ramana Maharshi. And so I was reading Ramana a long, long, long time ago when I was young. And so I always I had an affection for that place. Um, and so 
I would one of my priorities was to go there and and, and kind of be like not not mimicking Ramana, but like living that sort of life, that very basic life where I, I would go to ashram every day, meditate, uh, sit in the caves in the mountain, and I did this for like six months in in Tiruvannamalai, and and that really like transform my life that that experience but also on top of that i mentioned bod gaya which is famous for the bodhi tree where uh apparently the historical buddha reached enlightenment under the tree there and just being in that environment um where you're meditating every day for for many months and that's kind of your focus that would transform anyone you know and, and that's not to mention also the, the the times that i've been up in the himalayas um completely away from uh any anyone really which which you know those sorts of experiences obviously are great too um probably more powerful in some sense because you don't you know uh for you know one example i, I was in nepal up in the mountains away from a lot of people all the only people i would see in that experience were the local farmers and, and and so forth and so on but i wasn't too far don't get me wrong i wasn't too far away from uh like like you know getting food and stuff like that like there was shops um, 40 minutes away so you know I could walk there and get some you know get, get some food and come back home but it, the idea is to be up in the mountains and, you know and immersed in an environment which, which is conducive for meditation and deep contemplation for, for long periods of time so especially those three experiences and, and specifically those places uh, have really transformed my life from you know allowing myself the time to do that and a lot of people say yeah but uh did you have money and this and that and it's like no i didn't have that much money when i was doing those things i was a lot younger even though i still do those things now well not now during the pandemic but but i still do those things you know i was doing i was in actually uh nepal in 2016 so not too long ago um in 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 my own you know self-isolation up in the mountains but the you know that people just have to give themselves the opportunity to do that and and also remember that life's not we're not in a hurry here you know there's no finish line we don't have to be in a hurry to excel in our career or to become somebody so to speak or you know or to acquire wealth make sure you know my wife and i our focus is always quality of life so quality of life is always first and then say, if this is what we enjoy, this is what we go and do, you know. So give yourself that time to break away from society and come back to the just the ground of reality, you know. And that ground of reality, you, from that ground of reality, you'll see that the world actually isn't a bad place as what the news and what other people, you know, believe it is. It, it's a lot, it's, it's much more majestic and magical than, than what a lot of people think. Well, I think this is a good time to talk about this other question I have for you. I think I have enough time for this. Um, in your book, you talk about how you become the master and live your legend. And I think for a lot of people, they may feel like, gosh, that might be a real big stretch for me. I don't know if that's something I can really obtain in this lifetime. Is it something that can be done? Oh, there's no doubt. No doubt, Marianne. It can be done, you know, like, because people have done it, right? People have become a master and, and they, they do live their own legend in this world, so to speak. So it's, well, that, that's kind of the, the conclusion of my book from, from understanding a lot of previous before, but um, there's no reason why any of us can't a- achieve this. You know, we're often in the self-talk of, you know, negativity where, you know, we're looking at other people, this, this whole cult of comparison where we're comparing our life to other people and we're saying, oh, we can't do this and so forth and so on. But that's all the ego speaking. And we have to reduce that, that internal chatter to understand that there's no reason why we can't become our, our own master and, and live our legend, you know, but it, but we need to be, you know, we need to become radically humble and also radically honest about things, you know, um, if we're going to continue, if we continue down this path of being arrogant and so forth and so on, um, and also being negative, there's no way that we can ever master anything, really. Most masters are extremely humble. Um, 
don't interfere overly with life and are not concerned actually about uh, social status and so forth and so on. They just focus on, you know, what they're, what they're good at, focus on their life, their immediate life. And, you know, then they will live their legend. You know, I, I mentioned a few examples actually in the book where I mentioned um, the, the, towards the end, there's a, there's a story, uh, the, the South Korean hikers. So, you know, a lot of people believe that, you know, I use that story for many reasons, but these, these, these uh, trekkers, they're not extremely well known, but they followed their path sincerely and they became in some sense, the brave hero. It's a pretty sad story. I won't get a lot into it, but it, that's to showcase that it does. You don't have to have fame and fortune to be a master or to live your legend too. That's a lot of, a lot of illusion that the world promotes as well. That it's, you know, that's not true. You know, we have to, once we begin to follow our path sincerely and we begin to become humble, we, we also uh, have a sense that we're serving something much greater than ourselves. You know, not just our own life. We're, we understand that we're a part of the world, a part of the universe. And in following that, we, we begin to serve something much greater than ourselves. But it may, it may not be to the scale of, you know, someone who, you know, like Elon Musk or someone like this. It, it, it may be just in your immediate reality, which you will affect. But that also reverberates out. So, my, my, you know, my advice to, to all your listeners would be, there's no reason why any of us shouldn't be able to, you know, become our become a master and live our legend because we're all the same fundamentally deep down. Deep down, we're all the same. We're all part of that unified consciousness that I was talking about, that, that kind of state of, uh, that undifferentiated state of Atman they talk about in Hinduism, which is identical to the totality of Brahman in as, as the totality of the universe. And we are... We are, we are all that deep down. So there's no reason why we shouldn't. The only reason, the only way that we don't reach those, those sort of, those heights is because we may not be disciplined or dedicated enough to whatever we're doing, whatever skill you're following. But um, you have to really focus on what's holding you back. You have to kind of dent your ego and allow the the nature of the world to take over so this gets back into the embodied cognition you have to down regulate that cold cognition where a lot of the self-talk comes from like oh you can't do this marianne you can't do that and down regulate that through a lot of the practices i i i show in the book to allow the spontaneity of the universe to to shine just to be itself and then and then you know and then the rest will take care of itself you make that sound so easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's not easy. That's for sure. It's not easy. It's, um, it's and, a and lifelong I, journey. I can hear what you're saying. I mean, cause this is, I mean, it, again, it's like, there's no end, you know, it's not like, you know, whoever hits the race, the fastest wins. I mean, it's a lifelong journey that we're taking. It's a marathon. It's a marathon. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and those, like I was mentioning earlier with the Zhuangzi, those who live the, that skill in their ordinary life will often get to that place. You know what I mean? So they are moving through life efficaciously without incurring any harm on others or, or causing harm uh, to themselves. So if you're moving in that direction, you're moving with that uh, that free and easy wandering, that free and easy wandering, that spontaneity, then you will get to uh, to the, the heights of what the, the great sages of the East talk about. It, that's, that's the promise that they, that they promise because you are moving in a sense as a limb of the universe instead of, uh, instead of isolating yourself from the universe and pretending to, to be this self that is excluded from the world. So, so that's, that's really the journey is that. And then, you know, the, obviously the mastery and, living your legend will come as, as a result of living that. But we really have to immerse ourselves in that and, and know that, you know, when the obstacles and the negativity of, of life comes, you know how to navigate 
uh, through that without, you know, interfering with it, but also um, in some sense uh, acting appropriately to each and every situation um, with intelligence, which is that intelligent spontaneity that I talk about in the book. So, Jason, where can our listeners connect with you and learn not just about emotional intuition for peak performance, but all of your books and be part of your community? Uh, Sure. Well, they can find me at jasongregory.org. And also, um, I have a, uh, it's it's a, not a big YouTube channel, but it's a good size. Um, Well, I follow it. It's pretty big. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. So you can go to, yes, uh, youtube.com slash uh, one world within. And so that's my YouTube channel and yeah, join the community there. And, and I'm on Facebook and, and Twitter and Instagram as well. If you just type in uh, Jason Gregory author on Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, Jason Gregory 33 and uh, Facebook, you can find me uh, at Jason Gregory author. So Well, Jason, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you for having me on, Marianne. It's a pleasure. Well, thank you, Jason. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you. And of course, to talk about your new book, Emotional Intuition for Peak Performance. Emotional Intuition for Peak Performance is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and select indie retailers. And of course, you can get it on Kindle. Again, if you'd like to connect with Jason, you can at jasongregory.org for more information. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Marianne airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.